first of all, um, we've got quite a lot to get through this morning. So if you do have any questions, can you save them up for the end and we'll give you an opportunity to have some questions asked at the end of the session. Um, I think it's important in the climate that we all live and work in in Dubai that we split this question up into two strands, which is how do we improve the writing of the students in our classes, but also how do we prove that to anyone that is coming in to inspect our, our lessons. Um, and if we're thinking about how we improve attainment, we can also break this up into a further two strands, which are the technical side of language, so the spelling, grammar, vocabulary, and then the content and variety of style. And by that, I really mean the, the imaginative side to, to writing. Uh, and it's quite a, a trap that some teachers fall into sometimes, that we focus so much on the technical side, so the grammar, the spelling, and the punctuation, that we sometimes forget about the uh, imagination side of things. And, and sometimes it can produce results uh, that look a little bit like this. So, what is wrong with the piece of writing? During the summer holidays, my family and I travelled to the UK. We had a stupendous time. Whilst we were there, we took part in a plethora of activities, including cycling, horse riding, walking, and trampolining. My favourite part was watching my brother learn how to ride a bike. He did this with alacrity. <coughs> well, from grammar, spelling, and vocabulary, from that point of view, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's got excellent use of vocabulary, uses a range of punctuation correctly, everything is spelled correctly. <coughs> no problem. However, this is a boring piece of writing, isn't it? It's totally unengaging, um, and from, from that point of perspective, yes, grammar, spelling, and vocabulary are perfect, but the, the style and the content, not so good. Okay, so let's put this into context of DSIB now. Um, to get a good um, rate for a lesson, you need to show that teaching methods are imaginative and lead to a high level of interest from in the students. That is not the product of an, of an imaginative lesson or, um, or a student that's um, shown a high level of interest. Um, and again, going up to aiming high and looking at outstanding, teaching needs to be stimulating, imaginative, and enthusiastic. Mm, okay, it's been effective because the people have learned the rules of language, but it's not stimulating to read, which would suggest to me that the, the lesson itself hasn't stimulated the imagination of the people. So really, when we're thinking about um, improving attainment in students' writing, yes, we need to think about the rules of language, but actually, we need to, with our teaching, inspire people, allow them to use their imagination, allow them to enable <coughs> develop their own voice when they're writing, and get them excited about writing. Um, so here are some things that we do at, at Jamira College to, to enable that to happen. Um, it can be quite nice to begin a lesson with an initial stimulus, a beginning um, thing or beginning picture to get the people's imagination going and give them the freedom to explore that in the way that they want to. So you can begin a lesson with a picture, with a song, um, with a movie clip, or even with just an object that you've brought in from home, um, or even just get the pupils to close their eyes, put their heads on the desk, and describe an imaginary scene to them that, that they can explore with their own imagination. Okay, so for example, um, you can get the pupils to come into the classroom in silence, sit down and say to them straight away, write the story behind this picture. Okay, it's a really good way as well of just getting the people settled and getting on with work straight away, right from the beginning of the lesson. <coughs> and then pupils can share what they've come up with after that and we find that they all take it in a very different way. They've got very different stories behind uh, each of their pieces of writing. Uh, what is slightly different about this picture is that even though it immediately speaks to you of majesty and creativity and creation and so on, it's lacking any sort of depth which will allow our students to engage in it. Which is why you take a very similar picture and you can't make a movie out of it until you add a boat and into that boat you put an actor and a tiger and all of a sudden you have a picture. <laughs> because the only thing that can make our students excel at writing is when there is conflict introduced. So into this, we need to be able to say, okay, where's the conflict? Where's the action? Where's the tension that is going to be able to make our students really excel? What is the problem that they can solve in the journey through the essay? And if you look at the next one, this is why this sort of picture is quite good at that. Uh, you have these rugged stone statues, uh, these brave soldiers. And you have a beautiful contrast with this little girl uh, who's war fighting. So is your story going to be the hero who's off to war, 
Or is it going to be the tiny girl who's left behind? A father who's not there anymore? And how are these two elements going to be resolved? <coughs> um, you can also use quite abstract pictures, and in some ways the more abstract they are the better. Uh, everyone that I've shown this picture to and asked them what they see has told me completely different things. <coughs> and it, it, it's, you, are, you have no choice but to use your imagination when interpreting this picture. So going as abstract as you, as you dare is, is often a good thing. Um, another way that you can allow students to open up their imagination before writing is to use drama. Uh, as a tool. And you'll see in your booklets, on the fifth page in your booklets, um, if you were, have a black and white book, but I think these are at the back for some reason, um, I've given an example of some roll cards that I would give to each member of a group of students um, to, to, to dictate uh, the type of role that they would need to play in a piece of drama. And if you look at the, the details that I've put on those roll cards, you can see Lottie it says, you are 15 years old, you are very easily annoyed at things. You have a close relationship with your mother, you are not close to your brother, you're afraid of heights and you don't like it when things are messy or out of order, and you respect your father, but you're scared of him. And you can see from the description of the character, I've made a point of putting good and bad elements to this character to make it an interesting and complex character for that people to, to explore. And then if you turn over to the next page, I've given you three examples of scenarios that I would give to people. Um, it can often be quite helpful to give each group different scenarios with the same characters and see how that turns out in the drama. And you'll notice on the scenario card, I've actually given them space so that they, they individually think about what their character would do next in this situation before they explore it um, using the, the drama. Uh, and this just works as a nice way for people to try things out, think about how certain characters behave in certain situations, and opens up their um, imagination to ex explore what, what they could perhaps express in, in a piece of writing. Okay. Hand over to my colleague. Okay. We hope the Arabic is correct on the TV. Uh, we have no way of checking, unfortunately. Um, what we wanted to do now is, once you've got your students' minds engaged, once you've planted the seed of an idea into their mind, they still need tactics and they still need tricks that they can use to make sure that the plant is going to grow into a healthy fruit and it's going to reap the rewards therein. So what we've done is we've tried to narrow and some of the skills done. So there are just five skills we're going to very quickly skim over today, um, insofar as time allows. Uh, but we find that these are skills that any student of any ability can access, and they can take it forward. And it's also unusual in that will allow our students to be creative and to, to really flourish in their writing and enjoy it. And the first one is linking details, sometimes called cohesive devices or cohesion. Um, my favorite film, uh, is Braveheart. I'm not sure if we can hear that. Yay, if you like Braveheart. Um, and there's, there's one scene where he's a tiny boy and he throws a rock. Throwing rocks is his thing. But when he's a small boy, he throws with his left hand. And when he's a man, he throws with his right. And that, it's just, for me, that makes the whole movie settle a bit. There's even a greater mistake. He's charging into war with his sword held aloft above his head. The scene flashes and he's holding an axe. And then it flashes again and he's back to his sword. And these are the details again, which tend to make our students fall down. Because linking devices tie ideas together like glue. They make the story believable because you set a precedent and then you go forward. How many of us have marked essays where in the first paragraph our character breaks their arm? But in the second paragraph, they're horse riding and swimming, <laughs> and they don't think the details through. And this is one of the reasons we wanted to focus on it. And the main criteria for us is that it shows planning. And it makes our students, it forces them to do thinking before they start writing. And I feel we all have the issue, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. All right. So in your handouts, what we're going to do, everything I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so, it's focused on an essay that's in your pack. Uh, the first one is blank, it's just a story. I put it in there so that you can photocopy it if you want to use it in resources when you go back. And the second one looks a real mess, and that's the one we're going to try and focus on uh, today. It looks like this if you have the color handout. I'm not sure what it looks like if you have black and white. Keep referring back to this essay, because all I want to do, it's a very simple story. In a nutshell, 
20 years ago, a woman uh, became pregnant. The son was taken away. 20 years later, she goes home on a train. There's a man following her. Can you believe it? It's her son. Then the story ends. Okay. In a nutshell, it's not particularly exciting, nor is it invigorating. But when you throw these five tools into it, it becomes an exceptional story. A, that our kids can relate to, and B, that we can use as a very effective tool for teaching and engaging. So if we look at the first idea, which is uh, in blue in your handout, the title is Coming Home. Uh, with your bright students, you can talk about the difference between coming home versus going home. Why is she coming to a place? With everyone else, all you need to do is coming home. In line one, it says Mary Irwin was coming home. There's an immediate link between the two. Towards the bottom of the page, we've had a big fiasco with a train. She gets into a carriage, and a man is sitting there. And every time she gets into a carriage, the man is sitting there. And he's always watching her, and it's quite scary. But she gets out of the train, he gets out of the train, she runs home, he follows her home, and at the end she locks the door and she's inside, and the bottom of the page, in blue for you, says, Mary has come home. Linking it back to the whole idea here. And then the very last page, and the very last line of the whole essay, you can see, he has come home. Everything has been resolved. And there's a beautiful cohesion, which is not possible unless we've done a lot of planning and we've thought this through. So sometimes what we do with our students is, I want you to write an essay where the first and the last lines are exactly the same. And that forces them to think about a story before they start their writing. Okay. Uh, if we again look, uh, we won't go into too much detail. You can go later. The skill of the story is essentially that they don't spoil any secrets before they need to. So, in the first paragraph, uh, we look at the uh, squiggly line. It says, at 18... She had acquired a habit of solitude as a defense against the callousness of the world. Now she was 38. All they're doing is telling us that there is a 20-year span between actions. Very easy. Uh, last paragraph. Uh, uh, if you look just above the blue, Mary had come home, it says, yellow photos from that unhappy past. They continually tell us that this was an unhappy time, but they never tell us what that unhappiness is was caused by. And then over the page, um, if we go down, final paragraph, four lines on the end, 20 years before, he had been taken from her at the urging of others. And now we understand, oh, I got it. Okay. But the strength isn't that they only tell us at the end. The strength is that they drop hints right the way through and they allow it to express. We won't have time to go through that the strange man is his son. Although it does say in the first paragraph, even when he's stalking her, he had strange eyes, not unlike her own. He was a man of about 20 or so, and all these details link together on this. And decoration becomes weapon. Uh, at the climax of the story, he comes in holding a cat. She reaches down and gets a big porcelain cat and hits him over the head with it. <laughs> but earlier on, three paragraphs before, they had told us that she had these cats. So that when she reached down and picked it up, it wasn't, hold on, where did that come from? Mm. That's handy. Everything works very well. And that's certainly a skill that we can use with our students. The next one is a big, and it essentially ties in the next three, and I'll try and uh, speed up so there's tons of questions at the end. Uh, but tension, an alternating tension. Uh, tension is a definition on the board. It's anxiety, it's excitement, it's getting you on the edge of your seat, so to speak. Um, we were going to do a thing where my job was to get you all to scream. Um, we're not going to do that. You can all relax. But, but try this with your students. Get them to scream. And once they got over their bewilderment of, can I actually scream in a classroom? Then get them. And there's ear piercing and it's terrifying and so on. And then say, right, now I want you to scream again, but this time 15 seconds. And it peters out after about three or four. And they go, ah! <laughs> and that scream which had power and effect becomes really quite wimpy and useless when you draw it out over time. And that's the idea that we're trying to create in our students, is that tension can't be sustained all the time. And I, I try and tell my wife when she was teaching, don't keep shouting at a student when he's done wrong because he gets bored. <laughs> Go be kind. Oh, you're such a good student. 
I'm really proud of you, but you did a bad thing. <laughs> Keep surprising him, and your lecture will be better. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So that means you did a good job now. Absolutely. <laughs> you did a good job. Okay. So this is what we do. A lot of our students, oh, I don't like English. I like math. I'm a scientist. I'm a logician. A guy does logic. And so what we want to do is we want to get them to map out a graph. So along the bottom time and up the side tension. Don't worry about the figures. But the idea is that when tension rises, they just draw an upward line. And when it drops, drop it down again. Um, and so if we look at the in the first paragraph of this text, Mary Owen was coming home. She had been late getting away from work. It was a cold, dismal night. Mary was tired. It, it raises these questions, which make us ask questions. And as we ask questions, our tension naturally rises. Then we discover that this person we feel sorry for has this man who's following her all the time. Again, our tension raises dramatically. And so what we start to see is a very, very skillful piece of writing. And we're just going to go through this very quickly. The first paragraph. This is all excerpts from the essay. Like a cat watching a bird. It didn't matter what carriage or what hour. He was always there. And our tension rises with her. Uh, but the next paragraph. Her journey was a short one. There's an escape clause. A get out of jail free car. A couple of minutes, she'll be home. He did not leave the train. You can relax, my reader. Nothing's going to happen. Uh, and then here she does, she arrives, the train winds off, but all at once in the darkness, he was there. Panic flooded her body. But the flat close by, there's another get out of jail time. And at the end of the day, you get an exhausting essay, because you, you're going like this all day long. <laughs> but you get a really nice essay in terms of the students understanding what they need to do in their planning. It's not a question of kill the guy in the third chapter, escape from the police in the fourth. It's a question of really plotting a flow of action as this goes on. I and mean, then this is what you end up getting. And I mean, there's the man, she's alone, and so on, and you've got all these things, and then we find out it's the sign. All the answers are cleared up until you have this nice graph. And what you need to do is, you can just show the, your students this graph, and say, okay, how closely does your essay match the graph, and this kind of alternating tension, like you saw in this essay. It really gets them thinking about what their writing is meant to be. Okay, so that, you long and short sentences, we're gonna write quickly through this. Uh, we all know this, but the idea is that not that they know how to use long and short sentences, but that they know when to use long and short sentences. We say full stops are like breathing, they're like heartbeats, okay? And so what we do is everybody uh, watch me and just breathe with my hands. So we breathe out and in, and out and in. And we can all feel, uh, and then there's a real calming in the room. <laughs> Maybe it's just me because I've been talking too much. And then as we start to speed up, and, uh, and then uh, and we start to hyperventilate, the tension picks up. And that's what we teach our students. And we often say to them, we are not going to breathe until you put a full stop. So if you want me to die, just write a really long sentence with nothing going on. Okay. So here's some examples from that. And uh, what I'd like you to do, please, is this. Every time there's a full stop or an exclamation mark, I would like you to stand up and sit down, please. As I'm reading through this. Alright, so. Everybody reading? He was there. And now, uh, her throat contracted. And now, uh, and now, uh, and it flooded her body. Uh, tonight, he had followed her. And if you were out of breath, two things. A. Is this story more? <laughs> we haven't trained him yet, but You get some idea of what the writer was trying to get you to feel in terms of your heart rate. Which is a nice exercise just to get the kids focusing on public enemy number one sometimes, which is that little talk stuff. Okay, by contrast, everybody says this is when a man is outside her house, she's locked herself in the door, she's safe. So everybody say, there's a man outside. And you've got four people. <laughs> okay, and now how do you reduce tension when there's this man who knows where she lives? She's trapped, he's there, all of these different things. And the easiest way to do it is to create a list. So as we read through this, I'm going to say the number, and if you could just say, read out the action. So if I read number one, you're going to read, close the curtain. Okay. Just so we can get an idea of just how much information they put into this paragraph. Minutes went by. All was silent, inside and out. At last, she, number one. Close the curtain. And two. Close the Three. She has a 
Okay, so now moving uh, on to the, the second strand that I pointed out at the beginning of the session, which is, okay, it's all well and good improving the attainment of the students in our class, but the environment that we all work in is that we need to be able to prove that we've done this. Okay, and so just to refer back to the DSIB criteria, um, the bottom uh, cri uh, sentence there is what you need to, to achieve good in your lesson. Most students make good progress. And the top one is the outstanding criteria. All students are growing in their work and make considerably better progress than might be expected. Okay, so I've, I've no doubt that in most of all of our lessons, these things happen, but how do we make sure that it's clear to someone coming into our lessons to look at what we're doing? And that the best way to do this is to make sure that your success is measurable. And to make your success measurable, you need to set clear student-friendly targets at the beginning of the lesson that they can tick off at the end of the lesson and say, I've done that today, I've achieved that. Um, one thing that I really like doing is allowing people to write their own personalised targets at the beginning of the lesson that are relevant to their own work and it promotes independent learning skills. Uh, and something that you can do to, to show both of these strands is actually give them one target, one technical target, like I want you to improve your use of semicolons today, I want you to use two correctly in your writing, um, and that they can come up with their own imaginative content-based target that's relevant to their own writing. Here are some examples of some technical targets. You can see here, um, referring to the use of semicolons, personification, short sentences, using a thesaurus, but all very easy to follow, straightforward targets, and easy for people to see that whether or not they've met those at the end of the lesson. And here are some content-based targets, which are linked to, to the content that we've been looking at today. Okay. Um, and something that's also a really good tool is going to showing that you've assessed every people at the end of a lesson. <coughs> it's really possible if you're doing it yourself is to train the students to peer assess each other. So they can read each other's individualised targets and check each other's work. Oh, what do I think? Have you done this? Yes, you've done that, you've done that. Oh, I've got another suggestion for something you could have done to, to, to improve this target further. And that way, at the end of every lesson, an inspector can see that every child in that lesson has moved from one point to another and that they've all checked and assessed each other's work uh, at the end of that lesson for you. Okay, so in answer to our questions then, uh, how do we improve attainment? We need to think about, yes, the rules of language, yes, teaching people about grammar, about vocabulary. We mustn't forget the other side of things, which is teaching them to use their imagination, inspiring them to write interesting and engaging texts, making them excited about writing. I think it's quite clear when you read someone writing that they weren't excited about. It's quite obvious that they were bored when they were writing that. Um, and also that we need to just make our lives easier on ourselves and make sure that we've proven that our people can move from one point to another by the end of our lesson. Great, thank you very much.